Speakers, the Assembly is resumed. Paul Given has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Justice. And I would remind members that they wish to ask a question to continue to rise in their place. The member who originally asked the, the table to question will be automatically offered a supplementary question. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Justice for her assessment of the police enforcement powers related to COVID-19 regulations following the breach of Regulation 6 in respect of the mass gathering that took place outside Belfast City Hall on 3rd of June 2020. I call the Minister of Justice. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And um, before I answer the question, I want to preface my answer um, by setting out the context um, in which this has come about. I received very late notice of this question, no fault of the questioner who submitted in good time, um, but due to it not being passed on um, to my officials via TEO last night, as would normally be the case. By the time I was made aware of the question at 20 past 12 today, it had already been accepted by the Speaker. Under normal circumstances, I would not answer questions on operational matters in relation to policing in the Chamber. However, I am here as a courtesy to the Chair of the Committee, who asked the question in good faith and in good time, and I believe has a right to expect some answer, albeit I would argue not from me, um, and also to the Assembly. Um, because I believe it would have been discourteous not to come when there was an expectation that an answer would be given. However, I want to put it on the record that no precedent should be taken from the fact that I am answering this question here this afternoon. The Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 were made by the Health Department on 28th of March in response to the serious and imminent threat to public health posed by coronavirus. Regulation 6 places restrictions on gatherings in a public place during this emergency period and provides the police with powers to take enforcement action where there has been a breach of these restrictions. Decisions on what enforcement action should be taken are a matter for the police based on their operational assessment. Anyone who has complaints or concerns about operational policing decisions can have them addressed by contacting the Police Ombudsman for Northern Ireland. With respect to the powers available, no further powers for enforcement have been requested by the PSNI in any exchanges with me. Further, can I say that at this point in the coronavirus pandemic, where we are relaxing the restrictions on a progressive, but I, I believe um, a cautious basis, as we give people more freedom, we will also be delegating to people more responsibility. And as I have said before, we should not therefore rely on enforcement for our protection in the future. Thank you. I call Paul Given for a supplementary. Speaker, the Assistant Chief Constable Alan Todd has already said that Regulation 5 is no longer uh, a matter that is being policed because there are so many exceptions to the rule that they're not uh, enforcing this unless there is a blatant disregard. Then a uh, mass gathering, Deputy Speaker, was facilitated by the police service on the 3rd of June with follow-up comments that it was proportionate. Any wonder there was then further protests on the Saturday in Londonderry and in Belfast. Given that both Regulation 5 and 6 have now been undermined, their credibility and integrity have been undermined as a result of the policing of these protests that have taken place and their inaction, what confidence can the Minister have that these regulations that we are now asking the police to enforce is putting public confidence in them in a way that I believe undermines their position? And will she feed into the executive the broad concern that exists that these regulations, by not being enforced and by not being policed, have then undermined their credibility and the public are then left to take decisions by exercising their own best judgment, which is going to be the way forward in the future? Well, I thank the member for his supplementary, though I do not accept his analysis of the policing of the situation. However, I reiterate that when it comes to issues which are about operational policing, it is not for this House to question the Justice Minister. I am not the policing minister. I am the Justice Minister. And it is not for members of this House to question me for my assessment um, of operational matters. 
I have stated that with respect to the powers available, no further powers have been requested. I am also not in a position to comment on what Alan Todd has or has not said in the public domain. However, members can reach their own judgment about that. I would gently remind the member, however, that many of the exceptions to which um, ACC Todd refers are those which were requested and indeed preemptively announced um, by his own colleague in Ligon Valley. And therefore, it would be fair to say that having requested that people have more freedom to move, more freedom to travel, um, more exceptions to the reasons not to, it therefore was always going to become more difficult for the police to enforce those regulations. And if he chooses to, uh, uh, to liaise with his executive colleagues, they will make him well aware that I raised those concerns at that time, and I have continued to raise them since. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Last Can Cordia. Um, will the Minister agree with me that there's going to be events arise and gatherings which arise which either side or the multitude of sides in an argument may not agree with? But the key to this is this that we can't expect the police to adopt one approach to a gathering or a funeral or a procession which we disagree with and then ignore another funeral or a gathering or a procession which we may have sympathy with. The key is that the police have to approach this with uh, a common approach, that they have to be fair, they have to be transparent in what they are doing. It's not about who gathered, it's about the law being enforced impartially. Well, I thank the member for the point that he makes, and I think it is an important one. It is important that the police are impartial. It is also important that they are seen to be impartial in their enforcement of the law. And I think it is too easy at times to judge whether they have acted in a proportionate and impartial manner based on partial information about situations. And I think that there is a huge risk on all of us and a huge duty effectively on all of us to desist from doing that because that in itself can undermine um, the respect for the police. With respect to how this is taken forward, I agree also that the police should have a consistent approach. They announced that that approach would be a four-stage approach, four A's, that they would first engage, they would then educate and explain, and they would then encourage. So they would engage with people who were about to breach the regulations or breaching the regulations. They would explain why that was the case. They would then go forward and they would encourage people to move on. And the fourth A is that they would enforce. The final stage would be enforcement, not the first option, but the final stage. In recognition uh, that these are health regulations and therefore their role is a very delicate and sensitive one. With respect to consistency, um, I think members should also note that the Northern Ireland Policing Board itself has initiated a review of policing under the coronavirus regulations led by their human rights adviser to ensure that the police can give robust and clear feedback that would be useful should there be any further pandemic or should there be a second wave in this particular one. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you to the Minister for coming and answering the urgent oral. Can I ask her um, two questions, one specific, one broad? Could she shed some light on something that uh, some um, groups have been concerned about, which is that there appears to have been, um, and I, I don't know if she's able to, to, to give clarification, a late change on Friday evening to the enforcement powers of uh, around uh, Regulation 6A, the Health Protection Coronavirus Regulations NI 2020. Um, that seems to have been tabled by the executive at 5 p.m. to come into force at 11 p.m. Could she confirm if that's correct? And whatever, and I agree with John O'Dowd about the um, consistency in application that with a protest going ahead the next day, that is perhaps not ideal in terms of people having clarity over enforcement. And would she secondly agree with me that while Again, I agree that we should all be following social distancing rules, and that is absolutely clear, that it's very important that we have proportionate policing in terms of fines and, um, and, and, and penalties that are given, and also that people... Are Can I remind members to, an opportunity to ask I a question? That. Minister. And I, uh, that, that lawful Minister. protest is, is allowed as much as purchasing garden Order. furniture. Order. Right. Minister. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. With respect to the changes to the coronavirus regulations, let me be clear. The coronavirus regulations changes were announced, I think, about 10 to 15 days prior to the changes being laid on that Friday evening.
They were a relaxation. So anyone who breached the regulations, as stated on Friday night, would have breached them by more had they breached them unamended. So it went from a maximum gathering of two to a maximum gathering of six. So no one was disadvantaged in the fact that the regulations were laid. It did take the Health Minister and the Health Department slightly longer um, in terms of laying the regulations than I think was anticipated. Um, I think it may have been around 10 days um, to lay the regulations to match the announcement which had already been made. But it was clear that that was the direction of travel during the relaxation. Members will appreciate um, that you know, ministers are amending legislation in very short time frames, um, but it needs to be accurate and clear and concise. And therefore, there was a delay while that was able to be achieved. But there was no disadvantage um, to those who opted to protest. Their position would have been illegal before and after um, the regulations were altered. Further, with respect to the need for proportionate policing, I agree. I think policing should be proportionate, should be transparent, and moreover, should be accountable. And anyone who believes that policing on this occasion or any other occasion was none of those things or not all of those things has recourse to the police ombudsman. And that is the route that they should take with their complaint. Uh, I, I call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Does the Minister agree with me that uh, the basis of the question, uh, the scrutiny and operations of the police in relation to this, lie with for, for scrutiny and accountability the Northern Ireland Policing Board, where members questioning are well represented and where some of us are already raising these issues, as is on the public record? Well, I thank my colleague um, for that helpful um, question, and it is, of course, correct. Um, that it is the policing board, first and foremost, that should hold the chief constable to account for his actions and for the choices that are made in terms of operational policing and other matters. That is the right forum for this questioning to take place, not the assembly where we do not control policing. The structures in policing were very clearly divided between justice and policing at the time of devolution. And I am not going to impinge either on the chief constable's independence um, when it comes to operational issues or to trample roughshod over the responsibilities of the policing board to hold him to account. I call Jonathan Buckley. I'm sure the Minister will join with me in condemning the attacks on police officers right across the United Kingdom as a result of ongoing protests. And in light of the despicable attacks on war memorials and other memorials across the United Kingdom, can the Minister give us an assurance that this type of activity will not be tolerated in Northern Ireland? For if it had not have been for their sacrifice, none of us would reserve the very right to protest in this country. I have no reservations in, in condemning any form of violence or lawbreaking in our society. I call Dolores Kelly. Deputy Speaker and Minister, as a member of the Policing Board, I welcome your very firm reassurance that it is the Policing Board that holds the Chief Constable uh, to account on his operational decisions, and we will continue to do so. But does the Minister uh, agree with me that the police are between a rock and a hard place? You have already said that the interpretation of the regulations and the issue, there is time delay, there is a lack of clarity, and the police have made that comment on more than one occasion. And can the Minister provide any update? I asked uh, the First and Deputy First Minister about three weeks ago around the issue of designation of other officers in the public sector, for example, traffic wardens, environmental health officers, around the enforcement, because the police simply cannot police and do their other work. Uh, the regulations under the health regulations in relation to social distancing, etc. Well, I, th I thank the member for her question, and she will be aware that I have raised the, the issue about the further designation of other bodies. And indeed, I believe that SOLAS were consulted and that councils can now enforce these regulations. It's very clear that as we move out of this pandemic, increasingly those responsible and appropriate to make the judgments about whether or not regulations um, are being enforced and indeed whether good practice is being implemented um, will fall way beyond the powers and indeed way beyond the locus of policing matters. And so it's hugely important that we encourage those with the right expertise in whatever field that may be, um, to be party to the enforcement and encouragement of people to keep within the guidance. We should not lose sight, Mr Deputy Speaker, of the reason for these regulations. It is to protect life. It is not to deprive people of liberty. 
call Paul Free. Would the Minister agree with me that the draconian legislation is impossible to police? To police every single twist and turn of a person's life, and even within their very homes, it is impossible for the police to police and enforce that. And is the Minister, having answered my colleague, uh, Mr Paul Gavin, is the Minister suggesting to this House that she does not support the lifting of any of these restrictions thus far and to date? Well, I can assure the member that if that was what I wanted to say, I would say it clearly and unequivocally, and no one would go out of the chamber in any doubt if that was the message I was sending, and it is not. What I am saying very clearly is that with the change in the regulations, with increasing responsibility and um, being deferred and delegated to individuals, it is unreasonable to expect that the police, as you rightly state, can police people's back gardens, can police their living rooms, can police um, all of their daily activities. And so we rely largely on people's sense of responsibility, sense of community and respect for their own life, for the lives of their families and the lives of those around them. And we will increasingly do that. And it is right that we should do so, which is why, again, I have encouraged through the executive that we share more information about the very balanced decisions that we often have to take so that people are fully informed, not just of what the regulations state and of what the guidance says, but why we are making those changes. So that when when people reach a dilemma, because we equally cannot prescribe for every situation, they are able to apply their common sense and good judgment in a way that does not breach the spirit of those regulations and the spirit of the guidance. I call Mark Durgan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the Minister concur with me that there certainly seems to be disproportionality and inconsistency? in an approach that saw the issuing of 11 fines and community resolution notices in Belfast and 57 in Foyle, where attempts were made and adhered to by the vast majority of those in attendance to ensure social distancing. And there was also the provision of masks, gloves and hand sanitizer. And does the Minister share my view that it would not be in the public interest to pursue prosecutions? Yeah. Most of the issues that the member has raised um, are not matters on which I am willing to comment. I cannot judge the policing operation in Belfast um, and in Derry. I cannot compare the two. I was present at neither. So it would be inappropriate for me to comment on whether the policing was proportionate because I do not know what actions they took in detail on the ground on that day. I do not know what advice was issued. I do not know what guidance was given to organisers and I do not know what response they were met with. So it would be completely inappropriate for me to make comment on what are operational matters. If the member has genuine concerns about proportionality, then I'm sure his colleague would take it up at the policing board on his behalf or he could refer those to the police ombudsman for consideration. However, when it comes to non-payment of fines, to be clear, by not paying fines, people are also breaking the law, and it would be incumbent on me as Justice Minister to uphold the law and therefore say that those who have been fined have 28 days to appeal that notice, and if they are not successful in that appeal, should pay the fine, because that is the law. And I have no, I have no scope um, for flexibility in that regard. With respect to the wider issue, um, and in terms of whether or not um, people used hand sanitizers, masks, social distancing, to be clear, all of those issues are supplementary to the regulations as guidance. They are not a replacement for the regulations, and they don't absolve any of us for our responsibilities to obey the law. I call Gordon Dunn. Deputy Speaker, does the Minister recognise the significant impact on the community of Northern Ireland, a community that has uh, been denied the, the right to assemble at church, the, the, the denial of the, the right to um, assemble at funerals, something that I've raised within this House. Does the Minister fully recognise the implications of that? And will she give us an assurance in future that the law will be applied equally to everyone in Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, first of all, I have previously answered the member with respect to the, my recognition that not to be able to hold a funeral um, is a, a massive sacrifice 
for any family to be, to be making at this time. And I think it is evidence of a sense of public responsibility, but also of a sense of generosity on the part of those who have abided by those regulations. These are sensitive issues, but I have to say that there has been criticism on both sides of this argument. Some who feel the police have not policed harshly enough. Others who feel that the police have policed too harshly. Perhaps somewhere in the middle lies the truth. Can I remind members to rise in their place? I call Rachel Wood. Deputy Speaker and to the Minister for coming here today um, and I would agree with other members in terms of consistency of approach but this oral question is about protests held last week and about Regulation 6. Notwithstanding this, would the Minister agree with me that we must respond to the calls made by campaigners and do everything that we can to address systematic racism in our society? I completely concur and I fully understand the strength of feeling that exists about what happened to George Floyd. And it has been a powerful catalyst in terms of reminding not just us all of our responsibilities internationally, but I would hope our responsibilities personally and individually when it comes to combating racism, um, both the individual acts of racism, but also the wider and more systemic racism that exists in our society. And I believe that it is important not just that people protest, but that people actually take positive action to address those issues. I am somebody for whom civil liberty actually matters a lot. I believe people's right to protest is a fundamental part of living in a democratic society, and the right to peaceful protest is one that we should not give up easily. However, I believe in the current circumstances, it is not appropriate for large numbers of people to gather, but I believe there are many ways we can raise our voices in solidarity with the BAME community here in Northern Ireland. And I hope that going forward, it won't only be our voices that we will raise, but that we will put our shoulder to the wheel and make a real difference. I call Jim Allister. On the issue of proportionality, given that a headline demand of the Black Lives Matter movement is the defunding of police. Was it proportionate for the minister to reprofile her Twitter page to extol Black Lives Matter, given she has responsibility for the funding of the police? And likewise, the chief constable who used the hashtag. And is she concerned that a sector of this community namely the innocent victims, suffered great hurt from a spin-off of the events of the past weekend when the Assembly Commission, in a duplicitous move, decided to light this building for Black Lives Matter, but refused to light this building for innocent victims of terrorism. Does she share the concern that the, of the hurt that that causes? Well, I think it is unfortunate that when events of such seriousness, of such weight, take place in other countries and highlight systemic issues that are perhaps not our own, that we always have to return to trying to make this about ourselves. Perhaps one of the first things we could do about institutionalised racism in this place is be able to have an informed conversation about racism that doesn't automatically overlay it with our own prejudices around sectarianism. And I would say that gently to the member in respect of his question. With respect to the Black Lives Matter, it is not just a movement. It is a slogan. It is a phrase that I think typifies the emotions that all of us feel. Because to be clear, all lives will not matter until black lives matter. While any of us are not equal, none of us are equal. It should not be an affront to anyone in this chamber to the, for the Justice Minister to say so. I call Jerry Carl. I'm deeply concerned, Mr Deputy Speaker, about the PSNI actions um, at Black Lives Matter protests in Belfast and Derry on Saturday. People were fined, intimidated and threatened with prosecution for attending a socially distant and peaceful anti-racist protest, where groups like Amnesty International were speaking out against police actions. Can we have a question? 
I do, and I appreciate other members had a bit of leeway. So, um, Can we have a question, the, please? The Minister only hours after the protest stated that the PSNI response was proportionate. I wonder how the Minister can possibly stand over that, um, given she already indicated she was not at any of the demonstrations. Did she speak to any BME groups, uh, or did she even examine the police evidence on the day? Um, my main question is this. I, I think there is a number of questions there already, and members have BME to learn this is an opportunity. Order, order. Members have to learn that this is an opportunity to ask the Minister a question. You have already asked a number of questions, Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I think what I said at the time was that I believe that overall the police had be behaved in a proportionate way in enforcing this regulation. I have at no time said that individual decisions were proportionate, nor would it be right for me to do so. And as I said to other members in this chamber who raise specific issues and concerns, the way for you to raise those is through the police ombudsman. It is not to diminish the concerns that you have, but it is not appropriate for me to be held to account for operational matters of the Chief Constable, because he is not accountable to me for operational matters. I neither give him direction, nor would I seek to do so. There is a clear divide here, unlike in the United States, between policing and politics. And I happen to believe that that is important and it needs to be sustained by going through the correct channels when we have complaints and when we want accountability around policing. And I hope that you will feed your concerns directly into the review of policing under the coronavirus regulations, which is being undertaken by the policing board, because it is important that everyone's experiences are heard in respect of this, including those from the black and minority ethnic communities here in Northern Ireland. And in direct answer to your question, yes, I did talk to black and minority ethnic people, including some who were at that, at that protest. I understand that they were passionate about the issue. I understand that they wanted to make their voice heard. And in, in any normal time, I would have been with them. But these times are not normal. I call Linda Dillon. And thank you to the Minister for, for coming before the House. Although I, I think that probably the more appropriate place, as she's already outlined, is the Policing Board for, around operational matters. And I think that we really need to get a wee bit of, I suppose, focus on that within this chamber and, and within this assembly, that the accountability mechanism for PSNA is the policing board, and that's where they must be held to account, not within this chamber or within the assembly with the justice minister. And I think those accountability mechanisms. And has are the member a question? And you've outlined why. Well, I mean, I thank the member, um, and she is, of course, correct that there are structures there that are important and that need to be respected. And I also respect the fact that many people have made sacrifices, many of them voluntarily, in cancelling huge events that are very important to them, um, in delaying protests and other things that they might have wished to hold. We know, for example, the Pride organisers are not, uh, didn't, are not going to go ahead with that um, under the current circumstances. The Orange Order have taken a very progressive stance in terms of cancelling the large parades on the 12th of July. We know that St Patrick's Day um, did not go ahead. We know that Easter Sunday commemorations um, in the Republic Republican community did not go ahead. So everyone has made a contribution and the vast majority, and I think we need to focus on this, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland are abiding by the regulations. They are doing so not out of fear of police action, but because of the desire to defeat a virus which is putting our health service under pressure and has the, has the ability to rob them and their family of their lives. And I want to commend them for the work that they do in terms of voluntarily complying with the regulations. And that concludes this item of business. John O'Dowd has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister for the Economy. And again, I would remind members to rise in their place if they wish to indicate they wish to ask a supplementary question. Uh, Mr O'Dowd will be automatically asked a supplementary question at the start. All others should rise in their place. Minute, uh, clerk,